Desmond, how are you, brother? I'm well, Jack. Nice. nice to meet you. Yeah, you you too, man. Yeah, we've been chatting a bit on uh, on the old Instas for a while, and I've been an admirer of your work for uh, for about as long as I've been aware of you, man. Your um, your work is phenomenal. Thank you. Yeah. Ditto. Yeah. Yeah, cheers, man. And um, yeah, you're also saying in one of our chats, you're good friends with Abdul Rahman Abdullah. Yes, Abdul's awesome. What um, a guy! What a guy! Shout out to uh, yeah. Abdul. <laughs> Probably one of the just the nicest guys. Uh, yeah, just in instantly got on with. Him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every time I listen to him on a podcast, I'm, I'm like, I learned something new though. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I bet. I bet. <laughs> Hey, um, I was looking through your early works, as I tend to do, and yeah, your very early works you did in one reel are really pretty kind of cosmic and psychedelic, hey? Yeah, how, how far back did you go? I mean, I think I think you just posted one reel that was a bit of like a, a then and now kind of a contrast, and um, yeah, it was, uh, <laughs> it was really, I can, I can see... I can kind of see those origins in your work, but I mean, some, some of them really kind of like, you know, into like planetary and very mystical and horses and beautiful beach, beachscapes. Like, yeah. Um, what was your kind of, what was your break into art? What was your early work about? You know, what, what made you start making work like that? Well, I mean, that's about two thirds of the way back, I'd say. Mm -hmm. um, so prior to that, I had... Uh, I'd, I'd been to art school straight out of high school. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't get into the university courses that I had applied for, so I went to TAFE. Yep. So there's a TAFE in Meadowbank. And um, it was a fine art, so it was kind of a last-minute thing. I heard my friend had got in, uh, and uh, I so I just applied for it. Um, I'd been discouraged from applying for that kind of thing it's at my high school okay but um yeah and so I went there for six months but I ended up dropping out I, I just couldn't uh I basically got to a point I had no money yep I had yep. to drive half an hour or get public transport hour and a half and so that kind of the end of the second term first semester I dropped out uh because just at the end of the term, all my work was stolen. Oh, what? Uh, yeah, apparently back then, like that was 94. Um, people used to take other people's work and use it as their portfolio to get into university no. courses. Where, where was this? Yeah. So, were you living in Sydney, did you say, around in New South Wales? I was living or... in Sydney. And someone yeah, yeah. stole your folio. Yeah, I came That's to fucked. get all my stuff for the end of term. <laughs> That's and, so um, fucked, I, man. Yeah, my where... locker was empty. So, oh, they broke into your locker and, and ganked all, all your work and someone's, Everything. Gotten, someone's gotten a degree out of it, <laughs> you reckon? Well, yeah, maybe. Yeah. I don't know if they had that kind of work ethic. Maybe they didn't get through. But um, the teachers are basically like, yo, you got to produce something to get it marked. Otherwise, just come back next year. Oh, man. That's crazy. Yeah. Uh, Never heard yeah. of such a and thing. I was like 19 and I was just like, I'm out of here. I'm out here. Yeah. And um so yeah, there was it was another four years before I ended up doing anything else. So like fast forward, I was living in Exmouth in Western Australia, which is up the northwest Cape. I was working on a pearl farm as a dead. There was an eclipse hand. there recently, wasn't there? There's uh, a total yeah, solar it's eclipse. One the, it's one of the best spots to go for um like uh I was living on a in a caravan on the coast. And I went across the beach to see a um, uh, what would be called like a medial shower. Oh yeah, one of the best places in the world. And the normally like isolated desert beach, uh, there was hundreds of these like American tourists, like as astronomers and stuff with their massive telescopes and people having parties on the beach, just watching hundreds and hundreds of like flying, like just look like star shower. Yeah, it wow. was amazing. But there's no awesome. lights up there. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that sounds sick. Crazy. <laughs> uh, sorry, off track. Um, while I was up there, there's a, there's a few dive shops because it's on the Ningaloo Reef. And I mm. just saw one of those kind of uh, 
like under underwater uh, scenes that you would see in a dive shop with like uh, sharks and fish and octopus and stuff. And I was sitting waiting outside, bonnet of a car, staring at this wall, waiting for my mate to come out from the bottle shop, I think, something like that. Mm -hmm. And I was staring at it. And then I just had this realisation that I knew exactly how to do all of it. Yeah, right. And I was yeah. like, what What am I doing up here in the desert working on a boat? And a, <laughs> I was working on an airfield as well, clear, airfield clearing trenches in 46 degree heat. Far out. Um, I was having <laughs> fun surfing, but um, I was like, "This is going nowhere." Mm. Uh, but I, I was like, "Oh, I'll, I'll start painting in my caravan." I was living on the on the beach, and um, so I went back to Sydney for Christmas because I got dragged across the reef surfing, and it was like really hot, so I couldn't go in the water. So I go back to Christmas, and my friend rings me up, and he's like, um, "There's a there's a cyclone coming through." Mm. Uh, we've been out to your caravan. We've put the tie downs, the metal tie downs down, and um, he's like, "We can't." There's one of your windows. It's just not closing. Like the wind is not working. Um, fast forward three days, he calls me up. He's like, "Ah, uh, he's like, mate, you're the proud owner of a car trailer." <laughs> <laughs> so blew blew all the walls off the caravan. Oh, oh no! And the only thing left. Well, he sent me photos later. It was a basically it looked like a car trailer with a dining table screwed to the center of it. <laughs> uh, that was so that damn was, it, man. I went back. So I was back in Sydney. So I looked up the owner of the dive shop and said, Oh, I think he airbrushed that mural. And I was mm. like, So I go back to Sydney. I'm like looking up airbrush stuff. And it was like, it was 96, I think. So there was no real internet stuff and I'm looking up courses like for uh TAFE airbrush courses and I couldn't find anything. And then I found one little module in the sign painting, sign writing course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it said they do it in there. And I'm like, well, I could, I like signs. I used <laughs> to watch my, um, my dad had trucks when we were growing up. He had three like removal trucks. And it, every now and then the sign writer, Jimmy, I think his name was. So this was, uh about 1980 i was like five years old i used to sit there and watch him hand paint beautiful like drop shadow lettering on the side of the truck um apparently i sit there for like days watching this guy like yeah, right. hours on end as a five-year-old like just like transfixed it's super meditative um, watching people paint i reckon even more so uh, than even painting. <laughs> Even so now, like with a brush, if something comes up on a YouTube or something with sign painting, just if someone can handle a brush, like with that much skill and precision, mm -hmm. and and there's, there's, you know, people that you see the in, in India, that we like oh, yep. doing a Harley Davidson, like pinstriping a motorbike, like, and I'll do the whole thing without stopping. Yeah. 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 So I was All like, right. sign painting, of course. <laughs> so, um, I started the trade course. So it's a three year trade course, but you're supposed to be an apprentice hmm. and your boss is supposed to sign something and then put it in. So I just forged the documents, made up a sign company and then just started being an apprentice without being an apprentice and just um, rented a little workshop in uh, Narrabeen in Sydney and just started making signs while I was an apprentice and, like my dad had run his own business and I'd had uh, dozens of shitty jobs by then. So I was like, that's it. Um, I'll just do this. So I started making some signs, uh, learned to airbrush, started airbrushing some surfboards. So in the, in the sign course, you learn to airbrush. Mm -hmm. um, and so about six months in the, 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 um, all the old sign teachers used to wear like bow ties. Oh, uh, yep. Yep. Okay. They were like le left over from the from the fifties, sixties. <laughs> so they'd be like in like yeah, right. um, bow ties and um, suspenders, you know, the bands over the suspenders. Yeah. 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 Or yeah. waist waistcoats and stuff like that. <laughs> uh, so I kind of really caught the tail end of it. Um, and they're like, "Hey, uh, can we have a little chat?" <laughs> and yeah, so they were like, "We know you. You know, you haven't got a job. That we can't find that company anywhere." 
that you're apparently an apprentice of. Uh, but there's this one one kid was leaving from third year trade, and uh, there was a job going nearby where I was, so I signed up on this. It's like one hundred and forty-two dollars a week apprenticeship for yeah, three yeah. years. Mm. Yeah, I lasted about eighteen months and had a falling out, and then kind of went back a bit later, but. And up finishing the sign course, I was already doing my own stuff. Um, I'd learned there was a printer there as well. It was about 2000, came in the printers, like vinyl printers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we'd, we'd been doing murals, like hand painting murals, like landscapes, um, airbrushing vans. Uh, and then these printers came in. The boss bought a printer. It was like $80,000 Arizona. Mm. And, um, yeah, we just stopped doing murals and the whole sign industry shifted to vinyl cut lettering and vinyl stick-ons and Far sign out. painting was put on the shelf. Wow. So um, you were you were there for it. You were, you know, they keep saying sign writing's a dying art, so you were there when it when it uh, was dying. <laughs> well, yeah, but it's like any of these like amazing like any artisanal um skill it's had a it's had its heyday where it was like mm. used you know in a daily practice um but yeah that was the the real for as soon as you have a salesperson sales yep. teams going out pushing like a vinyl or a, even building materials like the horrible building materials you see now it's not because mm -hmm. they're good yeah. It's because a salesperson has been given the product and they can push it. Whereas, you know, someone with a little sign kit, those beautiful old sign boxes where you have your brushes and mall stick and stuff yep. and you walk around shops with a little ladder and paint signs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's no sales guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, it, so it's, it's funny talking about like dying dying arts and I was just kind of looking through your, your uh you know, your resume of, of many jobs that you've worked. I, I remember when I was kind of finishing up uni, I was looking into, I wonder whether there's like, uh, you know, they need artists to paint backdrops for for plays and musicals and, and things yeah. like that. And and yeah. I was uh, I was looking and I found one, I think I found one company, but it was super competitive. Um, this is long before I'd ever discovered murals or anything. And it, yeah, it was one of those things that was like, uh, it's a bit of a dying art too, you know, it's a, we're in the age of projectors and technology, but um, anyway, the reason bringing that up is that was you've done that as well, right? You've, uh, <laughs> you've you were well, doing yeah, scenic painting for for operas and things like that. Yeah, so um, uh, I looked into that as well. Uh, mm. So it's called matte painting. Yeah, so like the when they used to paint um, like either physical big backdrops, like that one beautiful painting behind you, behind oh, your yep. head there. Yep, yep. You know they they paint that 20 meters long and five meters high and then they'd film something going past it or they'd paint on the matte painting on the glass and then bring it forward in the image and then so i went to disney um i let while i was sign painting i'd learned to airbrush i went to the disney studio the only kind of one in australia i think at the time and i was i was dropping off some signs or putting signs on a little door maybe um mm. and i saw a tour group go through and they were going through and they said anyone want to see anything in particular and i was like i just i put down my little box joined the tour group and it was like can i can i go see the um the backdrop painting yeah right and so yeah so i got a tour of the backdrop painting in there and i've never been so disappointed really <laughs> like it was a <laughs> another childhood dream like just crushed because <laughs> the, the, the skill level was like it was lower than what i'd done just in the basic course in first year mm -hmm. so kind of didn't know how to use the airbrush but though just relied on the fact that the you get like five panels of glass mm -hmm. and then you have the depth of field with the camera so the back uh, layer is then out of focus right right so so what i would have thought was, was these beautiful like depth of field paintings it was the camera doing the work gotcha so backgrounds are painted kind of uh, crummy but they're out of focus so 
or just only the glass ones. Mm, right. I mean, I suppose the big backdrops, they're out of focus as well mm. if they're doing a depth of field. Um, yeah. So anyway, sorry. Back to the, I end up at the opera um, many years later. Uh, they were looking for an airbrush artist um, to paint some, it was like a latex skinned, uh, they're like big puppets. Oh, yeah. um, so they're they kind of this latex pulled around a, a wire frame by the props makers. The opera had at the time, not sure what it is now, but there was five to 15 props makers, three to 15 scenic painters, depending on the size of the job, uh, three or four carpenters, three or four welders, 35 textile and um, uh, textile and sort of wig makers. Um, so it was a massive, massive production. Um, they're spending millions per show. And their show's only up for a month. Mm. So I got to use my sign painting skills, my airbrushing skills, learnt about acrylic painting and colours, and I'd never, I'd never gone into that. There was another paint system, so I knew the airbrush system, then the enamel paint system, uh, the acrylic system, and then um, the backdrops. Uh, I was there for five years, so there's maybe 10 to 20 shows we worked on. Um, mm. Yeah, just massive big backdrops. Some of them are transparent, so you have to be really careful with the airbrush. But um, the initial job that I got in on was just supposed to be a subcontract um, gig. And they put me up on the scenic art floor. And then I got ch chatting to the boss up there and she was amazing Irish painter. Um, she was there for like 10 years. Um, and uh, she was like, when I finished the job, um, she was like, do you want to jump on board here? We've got a big, a big project coming up. Uh, but I actually got in there accidentally because they thought the guy had typed in airbrush resume to his... Um, in his email and came up with the wrong email. Yeah. And right. I turned up and it, and he was like, we haven't met. And I was like, yeah, that's what I said on the phone. We haven't met. He's like, Oh, oh you're the wrong guy. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I ended up in there and then, um, yeah, end up teaching at NIDA as well because, um, they kind of heard that I was airbrushing from NIDA cause they have a relationship. Um, what's that national school institute kind of, of Drama arts or yeah, yeah, right. dramatic yep. art, yeah, dramatic arts, it's kind yep. of the yeah, it's it's basically the only major school for that kind of arts, and they have a scenic art department, um, where they teach props and scenic art, and yeah, there's a design part and costume de department, um, yeah, so and then I end up there for five years because they were like airbrushing and then airbrushing on the props, and then I end up. They are like, can you paint portraits? And I was just like, yes. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> sure, I can, I can paint portraits. <laughs> so I painted, taught the, so that, and then had to recreate paintings for stage. So I was basically blowing up images and painting them. So um, mm. showing the students how to do that. Uh, the props painting was airbrushed on fiberglass and sculpture, foam sculptures and things. Right. Um, that sounds so fun. Yeah, and I had a background. I'd, I'd been, I worked in the theatre in London prior to that. Mm -hmm. I went in the uh, the World Body Painting Championships in Austria. Oh, really? Um, what were you which painting? Is, Who were you painting? <laughs> so, okay, so it was 80 artists from 35 countries. There was 200 models. And when you presented your artwork for the day on stage there was 10 to 20,000 people in the stage in the crowd on a massive stage with uh, big screens like a, a full-on music festival a runway <laughs> in the center for them to go out uh it was at the foothills of the glaciers in austria nice. and they it would turn from the the models going out to a full-on dance scene at night and then like parties in these castles where 
all of the 200 models were in their in their outfits like and the airbrush makeup and props effects makeup in a castle with all the artists who did their own makeup it's like the best party of I've ever been to. Yeah, that ever. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, that sounds so rad. that background of having that, like just being able to show those pictures helped in getting the, the work teaching and at the opera as well. Oh man, how um, how awesome. Like that just sounds like I could imagine so many people at uni or, you know, just starting out or wanting to get into a creative field. That's just kind of the dream path, but man, like getting in is the hard bit, right? Like, uh, you kind of just got it to was, push your way in, just be around. I always kind of just thought it'd be so much easier to go to uni and then just start painting canvases. Mm. But mm. like when I look back at the all those skills I use now, they're attained by like just a long process of like three years of sign painting, five years of airbrushing, like I was airbrushing Harleys and surfboards um signs backdrops mu murals i was doing like uh what i did like just weird jobs would come up so i'd be at a market so one guy asked for so like, can you do a dozen caricatures in this airbrush style and i was like sure who's it for and he's like oh for coca-cola mm. and it was for the advertising agency um and they just wanted uh, their staff to all have a caricature of each of the staff members to yeah like right. I, I didn't even know what it was for mm, yeah. and then I was doing like cr crusty demons of dirt like the the panels that go down the sides of the, the jump ramps yep and I was I, I painted a couple of Harleys and one of them won like a, a 15 awards around Australia going mm. like just flame, flame jobs and skulls Sick. with uh bloodshot eyes and flames yep, yep. coming up around them and cigarettes hanging out them <laughs> that kind of stuff <laughs> um yeah so I was was that your your kind of style at, at the time or was it or were you just kind of uh tailoring to you know the the client that was or... definitely so like fantasy art was my intro to apart gotcha. from disney mm -hmm. fantasy art uh through surfing uh, so like, um, uh, in the Northern beaches, there was a guy called Martin Worthington, mm -hmm. uh, who did very similar work to Roger Dean, who you've oh, interviewed. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And he lived down the road. I never, I got to meet him later in, later in life. Um, but all the surfboards I would see around the area had these airbrushed like fantasy scenes with dragons and like, yeah, phoenixes and beautiful like just psychedelic colors mm. um and then all the work like rick rick Reitveld, um another yeah. american kind of like surf hot rod scene stuff right yep yep uh boris Pagello, the uh okay, who wasn't an airbrush is. artist mm. uh well uh frank Vazetta. <laughs> I haven't heard of any of these artists. No. <laughs> Give me a I'll, list of homework. I'll send you good. some links. Please do. Yeah, please yeah, do. I'll... Yeah. That, so um, these are all kind of fantasy art, a bit sci-fi, re retro sci-fi fantasy. Yeah. All in that same Roger Dean era. So yep. late sixties, early seventies. Um, mm -hmm. Hot rod surfing kind of converged. Cal the California scene. Yep. Uh, so yeah, the artworks that I started doing after that, like, um, yeah, they were a bit sci-fi. So yeah, that, <laughs> totally. <laughs> yeah, 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 they're right. But um, it was, it was looking back now, like, it, like it's cool that I did them. But at the time, I was sign painting was ending, mm -hmm. airbrushing was not in fashion. Uh. I was too late and too early to the party. Right, right. Uh, I'm a terrible businessman. Hey, same. So, so <laughs> I was just interested in learning the skills. Like I would find something, I'd just learn the skill and then just refine it. And then I would kind of get bored at the end and then I'd start to transition to the next thing. Um, yeah. yeah, but that opera job, I got to 
so so for example one one project was uh it's called south south pacific so it's, a, it's an old film that's um um uh set in tahiti i think so you have um it was uh, for two months i got to airbrush pinstripe and sign paint a life-size model of a like a, a single prop engine plane cool so I got to paint it, pinstripe all the lines, paint yeah. those little um, uh, like the women uh, with the sign painting underneath it that you see mm -hmm. on the sides of old old fighter planes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, airbrush all the effects and the smoke effects that were you know stained panels and uh, sign paint all the props for the like if you imagine like a World War Two, oh, it wouldn't be World War Two like uh anyway like all the the crates and stuff for ammunition and sign paint them in the like stencil style mm -hmm. uh but then age them so yeah, all the sounds awesome it sounds like a great job and just uh <laughs> i'm jealous yeah i mean uh don't get don't get me wrong like it was a long process a lot of it mm -hmm. and sometimes it definitely felt like a factory job right um yeah, but it takes the kind of creativity out of it, right? The uh, it's just a yeah, you're, you're a tradesman rather than an, an artist. Yeah, but I mean, if you look at what you do, like you're painting the painting behind you, mm. you've got a beautiful design phase at the start. Yep, totally. You've got a, the first five percent where you're like, "This is going to be sick," and then you've got a long process in between there which is like a war of attrition just like <laughs> i've got to get this section in and then you're like okay headphones on yep um oh, i relate so I much to... to that yeah i mean yeah. if i'm playing for a show you know so so much of the creativity is in the the first five percent you know i mean the rest sure mm. like sure making paintings are is creative as well and there's a lot of problem solving involved but uh it's not intuitive painting it's it's uh you know representational painting so there's yeah, I totally know what you mean. I'm I'm now trying to set myself uh, much more uh, strict kind of deadlines, or not deadlines, sorry, just goals of of design goals for for no real reason other than to keep designing, keep coming up with the actual concept side of things, and not let that that slip. Because yeah, that is that is what keeps um uh, keeps it all exciting. Yeah, yeah, that um. Like a lot of my work is uh, like incidental, uh, especially with the murals. Like when I do a mural, like one uh, one designer asked me to, because I usually work with uh, architects and interior designers. Mm -hmm. And one of them, I just, she she asked, is there something? She'd given us me references and I was like, okay, yeah, I can do that. And then we nutted out the colors and she said, can I see the sketches? And uh, so I gave her like a A4 piece of paper with a line through it mm -hmm. at the like golden ratio 1.6. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I use that quite often, the, that ratio, 1.614. Oh, nice. I just Sweet. had a line through it and I gave it to her and she was like, okay. <laughs> and just <laughs> handed it back and let me let me go for it. So <laughs> did she know what it was? She knew it was the horizon line. Oh right, okay, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just I didn't want to I didn't want to commit to anything. Mm. <laughs> so I mean some people are funny about it, they want to sign off on it. Yeah. But it the the most joy I find is when incidental things happen. When when um, you say incidental, do you mean your so when you kind of start a work a lot of it is kind of intuitive painting. So there are like other beachscapes and things that you paint, are they actual places or are these kind of just uh, a amalgamation of, you know, different reference photos or different places you've been or do you actually use The them? last two, the, like there's one, can you see it in screen yep. notes yeah. just there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that's straight from a photo. But mm -hmm. if you look at everything in the bottom half is, is um like textured with a block okay. and then i get the the cement trowel and then pop it and then just smear it really 
So I was going to ask about uh, your textures. That's that's awesome. Yeah. So I set up the color, and then once the color's there, and you've kind of created a some detail in your three or five um, uh, like priority spots, mm -hmm. like where your where you want uh, your focal points to be. So yep. I kind of use three or five. Um, so I set that up and then from doing murals, like you can't paint all the details in a foreground. Um, that would take l longer than the whole rest of the mural. Right. So you better either leaving out the foreground and just having a mid ground, a background, um, or you just set up the colors that would be in there and then mess them up. And then people's eyes and like they look down for a moment, but when you look at the center, your focal point, you, your brain just makes up the rest of the detail and makes you feel like you're in that spot. So if it's the right coloring, mm. um, that's all you need. Yeah, interesting. Good tip. Good tip. <laughs> yeah. So because maybe like, why do you, you you don't need to see that detail mm. unless you're a, like a botanical painter that wants to have all the the um, objects there, or you're doing a um, um, a trompe l'oeil maybe where you people need to see every single bit of detail mm. um, but through doing venues as well you kind of realize that someone might want a plaster effect to feel really textural mm -hmm. um, but all you need to do really is there's things called touch points uh, when you're working in a venue so if someone walks to a corner and they see some beautiful um, uh, plaster texture, like aged plaster, yeah, yeah, they see it right beside them. They might want to touch it, and they'll feel it. If they look across the room and see a painted fell effect of plaster, they they think that that whole room is is textured, but it's not. It's just a paint effect. Mm -hmm. So like these uh, on the wall there, I don't know if it shows up in the camera, but I did like a quick kind of um, paint effect. Yeah. So like a kind of a, a surface treatment, right? Yeah. 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 And all That's, it is, uh... is um, all it is, is two colors, the Dulux mm -hmm. and a paint trowel. Yep. And you just put them on and you put a, you might put a stamp on your trowel and then like stamp the wall. Mm -hmm. And then you pop it a few times in different directions and then you like clean it off and then slide across it with the trowel. Same as you do with a palette knife. Mm. Oh uh, man, that's, on your that's small painting. That's so interesting that you're yeah, because but just before I was um I was looking at your work and I was I mean your work is so beautiful. You've got these like really kind of uh, somewhat muted tones, they're really seepy. Oh, sometimes they look like you know they've been weathered um and the, the textures look like they may may have you know had 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 some kind of effect of like sun bleaching or weathering or i mean they make mm -hmm. your murals particularly are just stunning on interiors uh i mean both interior and exterior but the interiors are just they really um they're beautiful but um earlier probably about a year ago now i did a, a about a week or two's work with a a company called Scanlon and Maker, and they 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 do mm. these beautiful um, surface treatments. And um, we were actually painting with uh, lime paint, which I'd never used before. And uh, yep. you know, lime paint it has lime in it, so when you apply it on a wall, it kind of um, you, it, you you come back the next day and and it goes really pale, like it. it they call it uh, blooming. It blooms. It it completely changes yeah. color to how the paint you apply it. and. Uh, creates this rustic look, makes it look weathered, makes it look like it's been, the walls have been there for ages. Anyway, I, I, I was thinking that a, a lot of your surfaces are like a beautiful combination of these uh, incredible, incredible landscape painting and, and this surface treatment has this real old kind of nostalgic, which, which I'm, I'm, I know I read in your um, artist statement that, yeah, this kind of dreamlike nostalgic quality, it really has that. But um it, yeah, interesting to just now that you mentioned it, that your your background does have that effect. It's it's awesome. Yeah. So and also, I worked every show that comes through the opera, for example, 
as a different art director. Mm. And so they'll give you references. And if you like most opera is yeah, say it's Italian or you have a Tuscan villa um, or a Spanish uh, mm -hmm. villa um, or a jail or like they're all aged and they're all aged to a certain level. Right, right. That, that the colors have to be subtle on stage, but you have to paint the people dynamic because on stage you're looking at it from 20 meters away. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, everything I, like I spent five years basically getting critiqued. So, and it comes down a line from the art director to the scenic art di director and then to the crew that the uh, the values and the contrast, they'll, they want it dialed down slightly right. back up. So, so you have to, um, and if you don't do it, that, that's you haven't achieved the, the, yeah. the um the task and the job, yeah. <laughs> the job. Yeah. yeah so just knowing that and what it achieved like i began to find my own like you, know, you learn to find what you like um but also how other people perceive it as well mm. um so speaking to a lot of uh interior designers like an early one was uh, amanda talbot um who uh was an interior designer and she would give me references and she'd be like, no, 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 like more towards this, more edge, less contrast, less saturation. Um, that would give you tiles and velvet and timber where you would have to draw the color out of. We didn't want to overpower it. Um, so then that gives you like uh, kind of then the introduction to uh, color theory. Mm -hmm. where you're getting like a split complementary color scheme. Um, I mean, most of the people, clients and architects, they don't really, they don't really say they're using a color scheme, but just by nature, I think a lot of people have a good eye for what looks good together. And it turns out that most of them fit into those kind of um, uh, color schemes. You'd get in a, like a, a color wheel, which I've, since learned are uh, mostly all wrong but okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's like five different color wheels and and every single one of them is not correct <laughs> yeah right yeah yeah it's um, um that, you know that uh i can't remember that quote or who which artist it was but i don't know there's some kind of famous quote when someone uh commissioned some painting and they said you know, why is the price so high? It only took you a day. And they responded, it didn't take me a day. It took me, you know, 40 years and a day to to, to produce this. And yeah. So, I know it just comes to mind hearing about, because your, your your aesthetic is so unique and just hearing your whole backstory of uh, all the different creative trades that you've learned along the way. I can see how that you've, you know, taking taking the bits that, you like out of those and making them work for you does come up with this incredibly unique um, art practice that you've got now. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I can, I could teach exactly like I know how to describe it, um, how to teach someone to like dial down the saturation, cut off the values, uh, have, it, have it a condensed value range. Like it's good being able, able to explain it all, but um, I haven't done, gone down the, like Andrew Tischler route right. where he knows how to explain it all, but then everyone that learns that method, it's like an atelier system where everyone just starts painting exactly the same mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. uh, so when I, I do see a few people sort of start to copy what I'm doing or be influenced. And then I'll, I don't get worried because I always know they'll they'll just keep continuing on their journey. And you just have, like most artists, they'll try something, get it to the point, and then go past it or take their own direction. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Totally, like that's that kind of steal like an artist theory, where it's like you you don't steal from one person, you you steal from a thousand. Yep, yep, that's what we all do, right? That's what every, yeah. every well, person does, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there was only one primitive cave person who had the original. <laughs> yeah and everything yeah. was from him yeah totally <laughs> and, 
<laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah, God, I've just thought uh, having really looked through your um, backlog and stuff, again, these interior murals that you do, I would, they're just, I would love to have one in this house one day if I ever, um, ever, ever get the, if I ever get the money, if I ever get the money, you're on, you're on my, uh, <laughs> on the list, <laughs> on, on the list, man. <laughs> so they're so beautiful. Um, I was reading your artist statement as well. And, um, you know, there, there's a few really interesting lines in there that, that I thought, uh, you know, really gave a bit more depth to to the, the painting. Um, and there was, there was one bit that I kind of wrote down that said, uh, you know, a captivating subject matter that encompasses beautiful landscapes suffused with a utopian aura tinged with the poignant undertones of loneliness and grief. And I thought, uh, yeah, having having read that, this utopic, utopic kind of outlook with, I don't know, you know, um, loneliness and grief as well. Like now that it's said, I, it, uh, yeah, I kind of, I, I feel that. Um, I was wondering whether you could expand on on that, um, where that's coming from at all. Yeah, the, um, yeah. Most like so I'm in Western Australia right now. So mm -hmm. most seascapes, most seascapes painting in summer, you, if you go to the beach and try to take a reference photo, it's like the brightest, happiest day you've ever seen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, through watching old film, film stock, or the gr color grading, um, uh, it becomes a storytelling technique. So the right. story I wanted to tell and get across in, in, uh, so it was a series I started five years ago where I started desaturating. I did a series of 12, um, kind of blinds, matchstick blinds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're beautiful. I'm like bamboo kind um, of, or on a mat matchstick. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's bamboo matchstick. And, um, so a year prior we moved to Western Australia and our first daughter had passed away um so the so first sorry. year living yeah um it was like full family tragedy unexpected um and i went into a year of absolute like just grief um mm. i ended up just renovating the house because <clears throat> i was basically crying in my dust mask for uh 12 months <laughs> um uh so a little girl Carla. Uh, she was almost four and we we were in the transition moving over here and she um she passed away in an accident oh god i'm so um, sorry Desmond. that's so that's yeah horrible. it's you you kind of never want the saddest story you hear to be yours um so yeah we uh as so my my wife myself we had a, a one-year-old daughter at the time uh yeah, it's just threw us into a uh it still goes on. Um doesn't go away that that grief, but um the only outlet I had for it uh was the art. And so through we trying to explain what had happened and um to people. So we were in Uluwatu in Bali when it happened. And so this one day was I was in the most beautiful place. I'd ever been. It's like the cliffs of Uluwatu, um, surfing out there, uh, amazing waves, beautiful sunsets, just the most incredible thing. And then the, the next morning, I went surfing, and I was I was sitting in the water, so down a hundred foot cliff, hundred meters out in the ocean, and. Uh, I felt this movement in the water that was kind of like, I don't know if you've seen bait fish, like small fish when they come to the surface, when sharks are kind of, or bigger fish are. Yep. Them. Yeah, I have. Yep. So there was this like effervescence in the water that kind of swirled a bit and I, I followed it around and then, um, yeah, it was just like these bubbles rising up and I looked up it was all kind of going up and I thought maybe there was birds or something. And I like just got pins and needles, uh, hair standing on like in the water, hair, you know, you get that 
feeling. Yeah. I've got goosebumps now just thinking about it. Um, yeah, and then I heard this. Um, I heard it was up on the cliff a long way away, like all the water cliffs. Um, was staying right up there, and then I uh, at that moment, it was basically when my daughter had passed away, like she'd, um, she'd, uh, yeah, drowned up in the, in the pool up the top. So we'd, well, I won't get into the whole scenario. It's a whole another hour and a half of, of tragedy, but, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm trying to get this across in the artwork. And the, so the, there was one palm tree in most of those paintings. Uh, like, and it was kind of awkwardly placed and you have a perfect setting, like beautiful colors and the colors are desaturated. There's no bird life. There's nothing. So that the symbol of the one palm tree is, is just like that, uh, the Western ideal of when we see a palm tree is like, oh, tropical holiday beauty. Uh, mm -hmm. We all want to go there for holidays. We want to escape our life and go to these places um but in reality behind all those palm tree rows is malaria yellow dengue fever uh unclean water no septic no sewer like in every place around the world uh it's really rare if you've got a like palm trees natural palm trees and beautiful water that behind those is not families going through like just trauma day to day trying to get through and we're living in the, like we were staying in a luxury villa. Um, uh, and it was beautiful, but we, we tried to get my daughter to a, we waited an hour and a half for an ambulance and then got stuck in traffic in a third world country. <clears throat> then got to a hospital that didn't have uh, children's trachea for breathing. So we had to go to another hospital and kick the, we kicked the, the doctors out and drove with the driver, kicked the doctors out. And I'd, I'd been sitting beside a guy and just met him and he turned out to be a doctor and he'd run up the cliffs with me and perform CPR. But then we get to the other hospital and then it's like, it's just not up to our Western kind of standards of hmm. things. So yeah, all this, um, beautiful holiday destinations that was um yeah i was just trying to get that out through the mm. artwork and, and the desaturation is just that life that gets drained out of you when you lose someone like yep. roses don't seem red anymore and blue skies just give you the shits it's mm. like you know when you're in a uh, depressed mood mood and someone comes up and they're super happy and you're just like, just turn irritable. it down, please. Yeah. Yeah, you get irritable from it. Yeah. Uh, which is a terrible way to be. But um yeah, so that um yeah, I was it, it was the only way I could get that across through the artwork. And um yeah, it was quite cathartic to do those artworks and um uh yeah. Oh man, that's, that's just so what's behind that. Yeah. No, just, just so sad. I just feel really actually emotional right now, man. That's just, I don't know. It's such a. I'm so sorry that uh, you and your family had to go through that. It's no one. Yeah, I can't even imagine. Um, and far out. I mean, yeah. I, I can see it all in the paintings now. You know, it's yeah. It it makes sense. Um, and hearing that backstory and the color and aesthetic choices to kind of paint a story it's um yeah it's all there it's oh how sad man i'm yeah Awful. yeah it's been a long long journey we had a i bet yeah many psychologists uh appointments and um i uh yeah i was at the wake oh before that we had a a beautiful um a paddle out where we had uh there's about a hundred surfers we gathered at the beach where we used to go to uh we took the ashes and uh, have you heard of a paddle out uh, where, no, no. where one paddle paddles out to sea and you all sit in a circle and hold hands uh and then you sort of 
you, uh, the family goes in the center with the ashes and you throw the ashes and say kind of uh, a prayer. Um, uh, and then everyone splashes the water, um, kind of a chanting thing. It's very kind of a tribal feel about it. Mm. Uh, but yeah, one of the saddest but most beautiful days I've had of community and you could feel her presence there. Um, yeah, it was quite, quite incredible. And when we got the photos back, the, um, there'd been a photographer there and he had a young kind of apprentice that had a drone. Hmm. And they, so there's drone shots and, um, the circle had, um, one of my friends, uh, Argentinian guy, he was like, I'm so sorry, man. My girlfriend and I were trying to get in the circle holding hands. But our boards kept dragging together. We couldn't get them apart. Mm. And so we're looking at this drone photo, and where they were, the the um, circle had bent, and then the circle had turned into a, a love heart. Mm. And then we're in the middle with, I think there's seven of us in the middle. And so it's this clear. It looks like it looks like we intentionally did it. Um, but the kind of beautiful thing was, uh, Kawa used to wear, um, a little pendant, uh, necklace that was a love heart with a star inside it with seven points. Mm -hmm. like it was exactly the same as the, the necklace thing. Yeah. It was quite beautiful, but, um, that's, that's amazing. Yeah. That's so beautiful. The, if, yeah. The kind of the story you're saying of the water swirling and, and going up as well it's um i mean god how powerful how surreal as well um i don't yeah. know i'm increasingly becoming much more of a, a believer of things like i don't know whether it's afterlife or energy or or souls con continuing on and uh spoken to few friends that have had tragic tragedy hit them um and there's a few there's a few stories uh that like that that come to mind um which it's hard if you're aware of it it's hard to deny it after a while like you could i was i, I was raised catholic i was an altar boy and a choir singer all right, as a right. kid you know mm. um got through unscathed thankfully yep uh, i'm glad to hear 18 god oh, no what uh 12 years of catholic schooling uh basically like they say about catholic schools it's like a an atheist machine just mm -hmm. like spits yeah. atheists <laughs> out the other side <laughs> totally uh so yeah atheist for five to ten years i pretty much until i met my wife um when she began to question my uh the dogma like whether it was a a solid thing i'd really thought through and then i was like oh i haven't really thought through this so um yeah so after that well after kawa passed away basically you you need to make sense of it so i stopped drinking i was at the wake good call and i was three three or four beers in I looked around and my family, they're Irish, Scottish um, descent. Everyone's drinking drunk. Uh, and I looked at my beer and I was like, uh, I'm not going to make it through. Like if this is the path, it's, it's, I'm not going to make it through. Like this is going to end in, in tra either me leaving my family, going down a bad path, dark path. So yeah, I was sober for the year. Um, like totally sober um and the first year of father's day was like it was going to be it's coming up it was really hard and my wife um booked me an appointment with a clairvoyant hmm. and i was like oh god <laughs> and I hadn't, cause I, like i was so cynical uh about those things and um yeah, so I got this clairvoyant, and on the, I was, she lived three streets down. I was walking there, going, "Oh, be nice, be nice, just be, get through, just be nice and nod and smile." And um, so yeah, the first thing she did is she's like, "Your daughter's been here, um, running around my house for three days, 
just saying, I can't wait till dad, daddy gets here. And um, I was like, okay. Yeah. Um, and so she goes, so it's like an hour, but she said, your daughter's here. And she said that she finally got the dog you promised her. So on her, she had three days in hospital and I was basically praying to a God I wasn't believing in anymore saying, you know, I'll, I'll give anything, you know, can we swap? Uh, and then I promised her if she came out of the coma that she would, I would get her a dog. And so I go to this cowboy and she said, oh, Carol says she's got a dog, the dog that you promised her. Um, and I was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> um, she said, I think it's your family dog. And she's like, did you have a, she's like, what do they call it? She's like, uh, like a healer, like a cattle dog. Are they red? She's like, no. And I was like, and uh, she said, oh, Ro Rory, Roly. And I was like, oh, all right. Yeah, we had a blue healer called Rocky. So she picked the breed, the name. The fact it was a family dog and I was like, all right. So I let my guard down a bit. And then she was like, there's a, there's a pay, uh, a matriarchal figure here that's showing me roses. Did you have any, um, relations that were roses? She's very short, very funny lady with glasses. And so my grandma's name was Rose. <laughs> so it's pretty obvious. And then she said, Ooh, there's a big, man behind her she's quite young he looks a bit like you but he's a bit bigger um and he's quite cheeky and so my cousin had um when he was 18 he had been told that he was he was when he was 14 he grew really quickly and his kind of organs the connections to his organs were too stretched and he had like end up having a so basically it's told him he didn't have long to live and he lived for another 20 two years or something like that till he was 40 and then he passed away at 40. So this is the grandson. And then she said, Oh, and his, his father is there too. And, and his dad had died uh, two years prior, like two years after his son. So she named like the four people in this one family line and described them perfectly. And then she said, Oh, um, congratulations, by the way. Um, you having a baby? And I was like, what? No, we're not having a baby. Do you think, like, we can't even conceive of, so mm. to speak, uh, yeah. of this, like, having another child. And she's like, oh, um, well, there's a little boy here and he's with Kawa and she's telling him all about you. So whenever you're ready, like, he'll be, he'll be down. <laughs> As six months later, my wife's pregnant. And uh, yeah, we have a little boy. So um, yeah, uh, I mean, you can explain all of those things away, but I chose not to. Yep. And, totally. Uh, what do, what does that do to your outlook? What does that do to your worldview? You know, I mean, yeah, <laughs> being uh, strict atheist and everything. I mean, exactly. I'm I'm kind of exactly like you. You could, I'm sure you could explain everything away. You could put everything down to well, you know, rough ballpark or information she had to go on. But I mean, that's that's pretty good strike odds. And I mean, I believe there's something more. I don't believe in like, you know, like God is kind of how mo it's described in most, uh, sent, you know, religious uh, narratives or anything. But I mean, look, I've had some pretty trippy experiences where, uh that have yeah. been pretty, can you know, pretty, I don't know, crazy, crazy. Uh, again, you can explain yeah. that away. You can explain that away, saying you were taking a certain substance and blah 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 blah. But there's, <laughs> um, you know, uh, I don't know. There's, there's something more. Something, something more yeah. magical to this reality than um. Yeah. So I mean, going. so the following, the following Father's Day, my wife. Uh, what a legend! Like she booked me in for a ayahuasca session. Mm -hmm. Great. It was twenty twenty people. Um, 
Yeah, and so I I saw Kawa again there. She was a phoenix, massive phoenix. That's a long story, that whole one night. But um, uh, I had a, a Reiki session, which I never believed in either. Um, and she turned up there and so did my grandma as well. And um, that that's another story. Um, um, another Father's Day mushroom ceremony um where i was i was basically in that landscape behind you there um and that's what i was telling you maybe a year ago or something like um uh the the guides that were there were, were basically telling me this is the landscape that all these artists and she listed these artists that come to certain valleys and they're like come over and see this valley. it's like a grand canyon tour mm. and um yeah you were one of the artist he's like this is where jack comes i'm nah. like jack <laughs> no way <laughs> really and, um yeah and it looked like so you, that that um, you, you wrote you wrote that to me because you, you're talking about this ceremony yeah. that you had and you wrote this is you know they say that you come here and i and i interpreted that as them saying talking to you this is where you come as in as in desmond no, literally, i didn't realize you were literally jack. talking about me yeah <laughs> yeah so like if, if right. you've obviously been there in different scenarios uh different ceremonies or whatever but that tessellated pattern effect that you have it you have it in like the ayahuasca was like going to avatar with uh, like mathematical tessellations everywhere mm. um and so those patterns effects uh where you have like almost like a um uh like tribal mask effect where you have the chiseled edges of everything seems to be like chiseled edges to fit in like mathematically into mm -hmm. like the little shapes everywhere tessellated patterns and then soundscapes as well like with the one of the musicians will like hit a symbol and you'll see the color explode and all the different notes will be different shapes flying off into your your landscape that you're in at the time Hmm. um yeah so anyway back to um yeah believing in another source or something um i started like to like grip on to dear life i started looking into where about afterlife uh mm -hmm. past lives and afterlife and i found this um it was actually john cleese was uh introducing a board of people, panel of people in I can't remember if it was at University of Philadelphia or Pennsylvania or something like that. And for 50 years, they've been studying afterlife or past lives uh, and finding all this, trying to basically take a scientific approach and investigate every story they found and go back and see if they could find the street or the shop that they mentioned. Um, and then I found all those videos about, uh, have you seen the one with the fighter pilot? And it's like a three-year-old kid and he keeps, he's sitting on his granddad's lap and he, he's got his toy airplane and he keeps like, like, yeah, and crashing it into the table. And there's always fire and he just kept doing it, kept doing it. And so the parents went to, um, they happened to find the university and they're like, we, what's, what the past life, like he's keeps saying he's a fighter pilot. He had um, three three pilots that worked with him who were John, like John 1, John 2, and John 3. I'm butchering this. Like It's easy to find on YouTube, just look up mm. fighter pilot, past life, or afterlife. And he knew he fought in the, um, uh, the war against the Japanese, and he, he kept saying he went down his bay. And so... His granddad was looking through a book and he's sitting on his lap and he points at the the aerial shot of this bay in um I don't remember which port it, it was, um, the famous port uh that was in the war. He said, That's where I went down, granddad. That's where I went down. And so they took that kind of book and they're trying to find out. And it turns out there was a fighter pilot that was in the exact name of the he named the plane type as well, this three year old. And they found out that there was, uh, yes, there was three Johns, John 1, 2, and three, whatever it was. 
Mm -hmm. uh, he the plane went down in that bay, and he was the he was um, rescued. Uh, yeah, so there were so many things. I, I just was trying to grip on to anything I could about afterlife and where, like, where is where's she gone? Mm. Um, and I think that doing that, having that different perspective of instead of the old narrative of um, uh, Christianity or um well catholicism that i grew up with where they'd actually then i found out they'd taken out reference of past lives you know uh 300 ad they'd taken out reference to past lives from the christian which was a pagan religion but when right. you have a perspective that there is an afterlife and past past lives and future lives then you realize that um and that you can watch over and you have a soul group this is i'm just running through my belief at the, at the moment it'll probably change yep yep <laughs> so, so you have a soul group maybe 100 souls and you repeat through through lives with the same group and some of them will bug out early and some of them will interchange and then your mom is your wife and your brother is your husband and um, but they're that old thing of like they're watching over you, which is in every single religion and and belief system. But they literally are. And so if you're living on earth and you get depressed and you're just crying and become drunk and a drug addict, your ancestors have to watch you do that. Yeah. So my <laughs> cat <laughs> um <laughs> little cat's next to your me. Sorry. <laughs> Your ancestors have to watch you struggle through life. So imagine like the Truman Show and he's just sitting for the rest of his life in a room, depressed. Your ancestors would be so disappointed in you. And so I took that mindset of, um, okay, my, my daughter is watching, looking over me. Why would I not make the most of life so she can watch me like just you know make the most of it instead yeah. of and look after she's got a little sister like if i was depressed and took it so selfishly that it's my tragedy and that it's happened to me this tragedy has happened to me instead of something has happened for me so the tragedy has happened for me. It's given me grace, which no one, no one wants grace. The word grace is, it's kind of been a bit um, misconstrued over the, over the, over the years. The so grace is that thing where um, you've been given a tragic circumstance and it's, you don't want it and it's horrible to live through, but the beauty that I can now see and every day my kids load them into the car or I'm dropping them off at school and the love that you feel, they could be gone any second and you might not see them again for a hundred years. <laughs> um, and you, your relationship is through a, the thin veil of, of heaven or whatever it is. Um, but those moments with my children now and anyone I've come across, um, the connection is is so much stronger yeah. Be because, you know, it is a finite, they're a finite resource. And you don't take it for granted that we've just got this time and this life. Um, so you can't just, you can't waste it. And all that time wasted bickering or fighting or just, you know, it's so hard watching these, like the war in Afghanistan, uh, in Israel, Palestine, yeah, Palestine, Ukraine, Russia. Yeah. It's like, yeah. Uh, it's so horrible to watch. And it's like, like the Israel Palestine thing is all based on a religious um, religion and, and like the forefathers were harmed. So instead of souls like that Palestinian might have been your Israeli father in the past life, 
So why would you treat them like an enemy? Like they're we're all we're all one. But and it happened in Ireland as well, right? So you have North Northern Ireland. Just that like ancestor after ancestor fighting with each other because their father killed their father and and it just keeps going on and on. And but when you have the point of view that we're we have an afterlife and we're all here to learn, basically sent down. You make a social contract in whatever's up there, <laughs> out there, in here. You make that social contract. Like, okay, so I'm going to come down uh, to Earth. Um, we're born to a Scottish parents. You're not going to be given much money, but you're going to be given a lot of love and support. Um, you are going to go through these tragedies. Like you're going to be stabbed at the age of 29. You're going to have this. Um, uh, meet a beautiful wife, have the most beautiful daughter you, anyone's ever seen. It's going to be three years of absolute like love. And then uh, we're going to take that away from you. And then we're going to see what you do. Mm. We're going to see that's your challenge. Like that'll be your main challenge. There's all these challenges leading up to it, but that's going to be your um, your social contract is to get to that point and then see how you react and your 139 lives you've had before has been leading up to this point and this is your next challenge so see if you can overcome this um and then so the whole thing of suicide you might have committed suicide in five previous lives and you just keep giving the same challenge over again until you can overcome that and just get through and then you'll be given another challenge in the next life but if you keep pulling the plug because it's too hard um you're uh yeah you're up for it again <laughs> yeah it's so, like um it's like can't you know karma i find a pretty useful kind of framework for a lot of what you're you know describing and it's just this the kind of i mean i'm going to butcher this it's been so long since i've done any reading but you know like being on the what the wheel of samsara and just constantly kind of repeating and repeating cycles and cycles so your soul can learn the lessons and overcome and you know one life you'll be the hero and then uh and then you know just just when you think you've evolved or or risen above and gotten things are getting so much better you might be reincarnated as the villain and you know to 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 help others awaken or 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 just be dealt the worst circumstances because maybe you actually are getting to a point where you are learning a, enough to to be armed enough to overcome those things, to deal with these things, to learn those lessons. Yeah, yeah. And the karma isn't you were bad in the past life, so no. therefore you're going to have to do this. It's you got to this point in your last life. Now we're going to do this to you, and this is your contract in your next life. Let's see how you go with this one. Mm. Um, mm. Oh, man. Yeah. It's so so beautiful what you described and just your outlook and just in absolute awe and ad admiration of your ability to rise up and I mean like like you were saying it's if it does turn into a thing of look what the universe has done to me you know and and you could turn into a, a broken drunken mess and and that could cost you that could cost you a genuine connection with your kids now you know that you, yeah. You, you could always have, or you or anyone, a, a a person. You know, there's so many, so many families that have had terrible relationships with their parents, and their their, their dad never loved them, or their mother never loved them. And then when you find out the backstory of what ha actually happened to to their parents, it's it's there's a very good reason for that. But you know, tra tragic circumstances often perpetuate disconnection, and um, to to be able to recognize that and overcome and treat things like grace exactly like fierce grace what ramdas describes um and it's that's a that's a, a beautiful thing man and it's um not everyone's able to swallow that pill it's easier it's easier to crumble so, um, yeah that's... it's a it's a dirty pill to have to swallow but um yeah it's a, a saying um a moment of forgiveness or a lifetime of resentment. Hmm. So, you, and the in this case, it's like the forgiveness is like, okay, as a father, I need to forgive myself for 
like just the circumstances like you start blaming yourself even though it doesn't even make any sense or and like bl- or blaming the world for why did this happen to me it hasn't happened to me it's it happened for me to help me and to help me be like a be- even better father for my my next children and yeah yeah um, um uh, yeah. so sad and so beautiful at the same time man i really really appreciate you sharing your story and um and yeah it's uh makes definitely makes me look at your work with a a different lens now and i think it only only helps <laughs> yeah and that's the other thing like the the beauty that i try to portray is always like it's a it's a double-edged sword mm. the beauty Mm-hmm. Yeah, and everything like the face of a child. This, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Desmond, we've gone over an hour, and I know you've got things to do today. But um, I just want to say thank yes, you so sir. much uh, for 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 sharing your story and um, yeah, just chatting with me. And yeah, I'm, I don't know, so full on, man, so full on, and um yeah thank you no worries thanks for getting in touch oh of course man um how do do people find your work and and give you a follow on instagram and all that stuff um or get a print or get a mural how do people find you yeah the the prints are through fox lab um prints i took the prints off my website because it was uh i'm just a terrible salesman (laughs) (laughs) make it hard Uh, for it (laughs) Yeah, uh, eight foot walls on Instagram, and uh, yeah, I have two websites: one for my fine art paintings, and one for the murals. Um, eightfootwalls dot com and desmondsweeney dot com dot au. Yeah, fantastic. Well, thanks so much, man, and thank you everyone for listening. And have a wonderful day, and give your loved ones a big hug today. So, thank you. See ya. Thanks, Jack. See ya.